Just I'll just stay hold listening. Okay. <laughs> Okay, folks, um, morning, welcome to the All Yes Media Conference um, on Tuesday the 19th of August, I'm reliably told. Um, I'm Robin McAlpine, Director of Commonweal, and I'm chairing on behalf of the Scottish Independence Convention to pull these together. Um, as always, the purpose of these is to let um, people in the wider world see that this campaign is very much more than just political parties or big political leaders, that actually it's a grassroots campaign with many, many thousands of people um, from all walks of life, with all areas of interest and expertise, who strongly believe that this is the right thing for us to do. So if I quickly just introduce, um, I get people to introduce yourself, we'll just go from right to left and just quickly say who you are, and then we'll get on with the morning presentation. It's always better to move to the left. <laughs> yes, it's <laughs> always starting to um, I'm Deborah Waters, Labour for Independence, and um, I'm a single parent and self-employed. I'm really not horrifically politically active until the last two years, two, three years. So. I'm Victoria Heaney and I'm part of the Radical Independence Campaign. I'm also a social work student at Strathclyde and I was originally voting no up until November last year. Uh, my name is Jonathan Shaffey, I'm a co-founder of the Radical Independence Campaign. Okay, well, what we're going to do today is um, Jonathan is just going to run over the, the details of canvas returns, some of the canvas returns that the Radical Independence Campaign has been getting. So that's over 20,000 canvas returns, 18,000 18, canvas returns, and um, what the, 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 the key line that I think we want to get across from this today is not that the No Campaign is losing working class Scotland, but that the No Campaign has already lost working class Scotland. So there's already a solid majority in working class Scotland for independence and the polls um, suggest it's swinging further in the direction of independence. And so um, we will ask the question today, what future is there for, for Britain if a clear majority of its working class no longer believes it's working for them? But I'll let Jordan run through the, the numbers. OK. Um, thanks very much uh, for coming along, folks. Um, just to start, what we are going to look at today is, I believe, the biggest public sample um, of canvas returns and therefore um, one of the, the biggest um, what you could call polls um, that we've had uh, so far in the, in the whole of the referendum campaign. Um, that is of 90 individual areas um, right across Scotland, the length and breadth of Scotland, um, so geographically diverse and over 18,000 uh, individual returns. Uh, now the Radical Independence campaign, um, just so that people are aware, um, was founded uh, towards the end of 2012 uh, and in that time we've held huge conferences, public meetings with groups all over Scotland. It's a broad coalition of socialists, greens, um, of anti-trident campaigners, trade unionists and so on. Um, but one of the challenges that we set ourselves at the last conference, which was at the end of 2013, uh, was that we wanted to take the messages of the conference out to communities and it would be a bit of an acid test for the campaign as to whether or not we'd be able to do that. And as you can see here, these are groups we have right over uh, the length and breadth uh, of Scotland um, organising uh, in areas and in communities. Now, so here are the overall uh, results um, that we found. 43% um, yes, 25% no, 31% no, don't know. But when you remove the yes, uh, sorry, when you remove the undecideds, can see that yes, 63.4% and no, 36.6%. That's out of 18,000 people. Now, what's interesting about this is that it almost is the official polls in reverse. And we believe that's because all of the people that we are talking to in communities, particularly of low, to, low voter turnout, and we'll go on and look at some specific examples, are in areas where the um, polling agents and the polling companies, the official polling companies, um, don't speak to. In fact, our um, claim is that, in fact, formal politics as a whole has forgotten um, these areas. And as we'll go on and look at some of the individual examples, we'll see just some of the effects that's had uh, on local communities on democracy, poverty and other social indicators. But clearly what we are, what we are saying, what we are uh, promoting, is the idea that your traditional Labour heartlands are not towing the official Labour line in fact, they're breaking from it and they're seeing the possibilities and the potential that lie uh, behind the yes vote. 
we think this is a sil uh, is a, a peaceful, a democratic uprising against the Westminster elite. That's uh, what we think is going on at the doors. I should just say before I go on, one of the things that's been pointed out about our canvassing is that there's a very high number of undecideds. I think there's two explanations for that. Um, the first is that when we go to doors, and I've went to many of these doors personally, there are the vast majority of these undecideds genuinely undecided. I mean, we don't just go around and data mine. We don't just go around and ask people what way they're voting and then leave their doorstep. We're actually going around and we're making the argument against austerity, for welfare, against war, so on and so forth. And what we are finding is that there are genuinely uh, most of these uh, undecided voters. Um, but we think that's partly because for so long people have been told that their views don't matter. So when we go around doors, we often hear that no one's come to their door before, that no one's been at their door in 10 years and asked for their opinions and so on. Um, the, other, the other reason if, for the more cynical among you is that, well, if you're going as a yes campaigner, then people might be more inclined to say they're undecided. But actually, um, our um, analysis, the reports that we get in, which we do want to be genuine reports, otherwise there's no point in doing it, these are genuine undecided. But we do think, in fact, we know because we do the weighting system when we speak to people about how they're doing in terms of a 1 to 10 um, uh, score uh, on the referendum, we do believe that the vast majority of these undecideds are not just moving towards yes, but we believe will vote yes uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to referendum day. So clearly, uh, something interesting going on. This is just a few of the facts about our canvassing. Big polling size, I've already said. Uh, usual poll is about a thousand. But actually, if you look at official polls, if they, when you go into areas, some of the individual areas which they poll are absolutely tiny. So 1,000 is their uh, you know, <coughs> benchmark number. But you, you might go to an area in Glasgow where a polling company's maybe spoke to 30 or 40 people, and that passes as a poll, not in our case. The canvas returns are of a specific democratic... What we've, uh, what we've wanted to do is we've actually looked at where are the lowest turnout areas, where is the missing million uh, in Scotland, and actually go and, and speak to people. And that, uh, lastly, as I've already said, these are Labour strongholds when you look at the electoral uh, breakdown in the, the past um, voting intentions in, in various elections. So we take Easter House as an example. Um, we're going to drill down on just um, a couple of examples of specific canvases. Um, and again, these are big canvases, 291 canvases in Easter House. You can see here that even when you don't remove undecideds, 50% of people are reporting that they are voting yes. Now let me say that when we say reporting yes, we're going to doors and people saying, look, you don't need to go any further, we're voting yes. There's a huge number here. You remove undecideds, 76% of people out of that canvas in Easter House saying they're voting yes. Absolutely astonishing. Because as I say, there's no contention as to the veracity of them voting yes because they're all coming to the door and enthusiastically saying so. But interestingly, you look here what we've, what we've found. They've voted la Labour in Easter House since the 1930s and in the 2011 Scottish elections. And at the same time, it's the bottom 3% of income and employment-deprived areas in Scotland. What we are seeing, therefore, is the erosion, I think, of the uh, Labour base as a result of decades of being sold out whether it's the privatisation process, whether it's the Iraq war, whether it's where working class people go off and fight and die. These are all of the issues which are beginning to break down. And what we've seen is a fairly rapid transformation take place in these communities where people are moving very clearly towards yes. Another example, we move on to Clyde Bank. Again, this is a very, very big canvas, 677. You compare that to official polling companies, that's more than half they would do for an entire poll we've done in one area. Again, 44% yes, that's when you have the undecideds as part of it. Again, moving to 60% when you remove undecideds. Clyde Bank, another Labour stronghold since the 1950s, and uh, again, suffering high unemployment dep and deprivation since its de deindustrialisation. But you can see again, I mean, this vote for yes is just not being showed uh, coming, coming through in any of the official polls, and it's because they're not talking to people uh, in, these, in, these, in these areas. Bonnie Rigg. We want to show geographical diversity. Again, the same sort of story. I won't repeat all the statistics. You can see them up there. But again, remove undecided. 65.5% of people voting yes. Child poverty in that area running at 15%. And it's had a Labour Member of Parliament since 1955. 
So what we are what we are saying here, right, is that these are areas are not just Labour heartlands. I mean, these are areas which have solidly voted Labour, who have solidly voted Labour for decades, and we think that the propaganda that the way the, the messages that the Labour Party are putting out are failing uh, to meet the the ideas, the ambitions, and so on uh, of of people, uh, and certainly in Bonnie like in all of these other areas. Greenock again, big canvas, three hundred and eighty five. We're seeing similar results come through, 65.3%. Yes, I do want to point out at this time, if you can start to develop a trend, which we are starting to develop, it tells you something very significant. We can see from the last couple of examples that minimum 60% of people voting yes, but often much more than that. This is not an anomaly, is basically what I'm saying. These are the sort of returns that we are seeing right up and down the country in these uh, communities. Again, consistent Labour stronghold, the whole of the post-war era, its Scottish, UK and council Labour has been staunchly Labour victories, and yet 65.3% of people, when you remove undecideds, voting yes. This is huge. This is absolutely fundamental to the, debate, to, to the debate, and it's vital that it's picked up on. Move to Dundee. Now here, uh, the reason partly we put this in is just because it's just such a massive poll. I mean, 1,807 people in Charleston and Dundee, I mean, that's a big section of the entire electorate in that particular one. I mean, this is big, big canvassing. Um, you don't remove undecided, you've still got 51.2% saying yes, only 19.3% prepared to say no. You remove undecided, it jumps to 72% of people who we are going to doorsteps who are, not, who are prepared to answer um, yes or no, and they're saying yes. Again, Charleston is in the bottom 4% of income and employment deprivation. So there is a direct link between being sold out by the Westminster parties and voting yes. This is clear from our research, clear from our activism. Kirkcaldy, again, and we're coming to um, the end of these uh, these examples, but Kirkcaldy, it's just to get the point across, again, 69.6%. Now, just to want to underline something here, this is geographically diverse. But we're finding when you marry, for example, Kirkcaldy controlled by former UK Prime Minister Gordon Brown, uh, you know, 339 people polled, it's a big poll, and the Food Bank launched in December to deal with poverty on, quote, an unbelievable scale. The, 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 um, the, the, the economic situation, the failure that's being brought about by Westminster is being met by this peaceful, democratic uprising expressing itself through voting yes and not towing the line of the Labour Party. And lastly, Hamilton. I mean, Hamilton, 124 people canvassed. Uh, again, a big canvas by official polling standards. Um, one in four people in Hamilton living in child poverty. There's high unemployment deprivation. It's a Labour stronghold. You remove undecided. 73% of people voting yes. Now, we've been accused, well, you could just be saying this, that, and the next thing. I mean, we've been accused recently by Better Together of, of merely being spin doctors when it comes to this. What we've got here is empirical evidence. It's not scientific, of course, but it's empirical evidence where you can clearly see a trend. The numbers are big enough uh, to, to guarantee that there is uh, absolutely something going on in communities right up and down Scotland when it comes to the yes vote. So just in closing, um, that's the end of the, the various graphics, and we'll, we'll send uh, people these uh, graphics, and we'll publish them online today as well. But the, the message real here is, as Robin said at the start, there's no question about the about working class support, Labour Party support um, losing when it comes to the referendum as far as the Labour Party officials are concerned. As far as we are concerned, they've already lost. And one of the important things about this is that the messaging the Labour Party has been, put forward, been putting forward isn't working with people. So they've relied on a corporate argument about Shell will leave, financial services will leave and so on and so forth. It's not working with people in these communities. And secondly, the issue of currency is not connecting at all in these communities. I mean, it's very, very rare that anyone raises the issue of currency. You know what the Labour Party did after the debate where they created their paper pound with Alex Salmon's face in the middle. I mean, in some people this has inspired a lot of outrage and frustration and so on and so forth. But actually, it's just not connecting with people in communities. What is connecting, as I say, and I'll end on this, is we're not just going around data mining here when we're going out in these RIT canvases. What is connecting with people is the power of the left argument for independence. By left, we mean 
It's for the welfare state. It's for a public NHS. It's against Trident. It doesn't want to see us involved in illegal wars. These are the sorts of politics we're taking. The radical left politics to the doorsteps of people, 18,000 of them, uh, right over Scotland. And I would just say this is just a sample. This 18,000. I mean, we are speaking to tens of thousands of people the length and breadth of the country. We're absolutely confident that if we can mobilise this vote, we will win the referendum. Uh, and um, in all honesty, um, I think that we will. I think we will win the referendum on the basis of mobilising these heartland Labour voters to vote yes um, as a result of decades of failure um, from all of the Westminster parties. Thank you very much, Jonathan. That was great. Applause at a press conference. How rare. Um, <laughs> One of the things which I think is also important to see here is that, um, as, as somebody who's been involved in this you know, politics for a long time, one should always take some degree of caution with Cambridge returns, simply because there are things such as confirmation bias, and you would tend to see that things might, people are more likely to respond if they agree with you and so on. What I think is important, though, is that this is <coughs> borne up by what the polling companies have done in terms of what they're polling as working class voters um, are saying their polls and that is you know they, they put different methodological checks on so I don't think there's much question left that working class Scotland has gone yes and it's moving that direction further and I think one of the things that I would be concerned about if I was better together is that the yes campaign um, and in these working class areas radical <coughs> independence will have the biggest voter mobilisation campaign that Scottish politics have ever seen there will be a massive mobilisation campaign. Uh, the numbers of activists who've been involved in this canvassing work is higher than anything that we have seen in any party political debate, certainly in my lifetime in Scotland. The numbers on the ground are ours, so it's not only that we've got the voting numbers, we have the capacity to mobilise those voting numbers on the day, and that's certainly something that I'd be worried about if I was better together. Um, I think I'll maybe just say to the other people in the panel, are there any comments that you'd want to make just now before we go to some questions? I mean, we were talking about figures of uh, um, voters. Uh, one of the, the figures that was fairly stark for us this week was that two years ago when we started the campaign as Labour for Independence, the proportion of Labour voters that were intending to vote yes was approximately 9%, I think. And uh, the official posters have the figures sitting at about 37% just now. We believe that it's actually much higher because, again, the, um, they don't tend to exclusively poll working class areas, which tend to be the heartlands. And we believe that the, that 37% is, is indeed much higher. And it's probably also worth pointing out that that 37% of Labour voters is based, as I understand it, on voter recall, i.e. who did they vote for in 2011. Mm -hmm. And it is worth pointing out that that was the worst election Forever. that Labour faced yeah. in virtually the post-war era in Scotland. So that's 40, nearly 40% of Labour's lowest ever poll are already coming to vote yes. So um, the trend of what I think that means uh, for Labour politics and how they're going to communicate and connect with those communities one way or the other, once this is over, is a very uh, interesting question for the Labour Party. Toria, do you like to say anything? Yeah, I think it's been really exciting to, to see people actually wake up now and start to question what's going on in society. Um, the amount of friends I've got, the amount of family who have actually never voted in their life, and they, they feel a bit ashamed to say that, that they've never voted before, but what they are taking from it is that they're really excited to be casting their first vote on the 18th of September. So I'm looking forward to seeing the amount of people that have voted for the first time from the 19th of September. Great. Well... Does anyone get any questions? Anybody at all, feel free. We don't have as many journalists again as we might, so um, anybody in our audience, feel free. Um, Victoria was saying that there's a lot of people who are going to be voting for the first time. Do we have any data or any figures about how many of these people... I mean, we're looking for a huge turnout here. I think there's going to be a massive turnout. So obviously there's a lot of people who are going to be voting for the first time. Do we know if they've actually registered to vote? Yeah, um, one of our main drives is, is registering people to vote. Um, we do it through public meetings, through having stalls, through canvassing, through holding lectures too. So whenever we are out on the ground, we always have our voter registration forms and we sign people up every day to vote. It's, it's, and it's gathering dust and people are actually starting to approach us now and say, I want to register. How do I do it? Can you support me to do that as well? 
But when you're getting those returns, are you noting down how many yeah. of those people are actually registered? I, th I think there's, it's probably worth just saying, making two points about this. First is that every single person that we speak to, um, we're asking, are you registered to, to vote? Um, so, so we do have that um, information. Um, and in addition to that, we always are sure that we have our voter registration forms and so on and so forth. We held a, a day of action at certain football grounds um, at last weekend and registered over 100 people in one day. But there's something else as well, which is it's quite difficult on a doorstep to get someone to fill out a whole form and all the rest of it. So we think that as well as us tangibly getting forms after a canvas, there's also going to be um, an effect which comes after as well, that you've spoke to people, you've engaged with them, we've designed our leaflet specifically for people who are undecided, it means that you're leaving something behind, that's where the public meetings come in, the public meetings are absolutely tied to the canvas sessions, so you're creating something in a community which we think has an overall positive benefit in terms of the numbers of people that will be uh, registered, the numbers of people that will turn out in the day, um, and lastly, it's important for us that we start to generate an atmosphere of excitement. This is what's going to get people to vote. All of the different things in terms of the arguments, the currency arguments, so on and so forth. It's not that they're not important, but people need to feel excited about <coughs> voting yes. And one of the things that we're going to be doing over the next number of weeks is we're going to be raising the tempo inside communities and city centres right across Scotland with buses, with you know all of these kind of things. We need to get yes absolutely everywhere, and that will also encourage people to not just register, but to vote as well. Uh, so I was just going to add to that. And one thing which I think is very important to remember is that Radical Independence Campaign has not been running this campaign in the pages of the newspapers. Mm. In these constituencies, in a lot of these areas, um, a lot of these people are not particularly getting their information from the pages of newspapers, a little bit more from broadcast. And one of the things which I think has perhaps generated some false sense of complacency with some no campaigners is that um, if you're not in the community, you can't see the work. There's this enormous volume of work that's going on, mm -hmm. and we don't press release it. We don't invite cameras along. We do it in these communities. And this is one of the things, simply because of the numbers that we've got on the ground, we can do that. We do not need to um, make a big song and dance in public about the work that we're doing. We're just working constantly and relentlessly in mm -hmm. these communities, talking one-to-one -one with people. Mm -hmm. And that's the campaign strategy here. It's not about dog whistle messages in national media. It's about one-to-one -one engagement on, on, a, on a very, very large scale. And that's why one of the reasons why we're getting these numbers. One other thing I do want to say about these numbers is remember that um, we didn't have to win over a lot of these voters. <coughs> one of the things which I think people have forgotten is that working-class voters are not unaware about what has happened over the last five, even 30 years at Westminster. And they didn't exactly begin difficult to persuade an awful lot of them. So there's a lot of this was already a disillusionment with what happened in UK politics. Sorry, I've interrupted you twice. That's all right. Um, yeah, sorry to be a geek, but just when, when you're sort of talking about that, that data for the people who are registered or not registered, yeah. do, you, do you have, for example, a percentage of, of the folk that you're going around who tell you that they're not registered? And also, I'm a bit mm. unclear about that because as far as I was aware, you were using... Yes, more canvassing sheets. So those are all people who are already registered. Am I correct? So uh, well, yeah. um, we're talking about yes, more um, yes, more canvas sheets are available to people um, that are looking for the campaign. However, yeah. there is still just plain old door knocking yeah. of people who aren't coming up in yes, more because they're not registered. And we would find that um, we do street stalls. We register ten people on average for every street stall that we do. But that's being replicated in towns, cities, and streets and shopping centres. <laughs> throughout the entirety of Scotland, but also um, there is now, I think, door knocking and canvassing and voter registration pretty much every single evening of the week as well, um, throughout all the areas in Scotland, and they are all registering voters every sure. single time. I suppose I just wanted to be clear in terms of this data that you're putting up here, yeah. if, that's, if that's from the Yes Motion, well, because when I went out with Rick, um, so, yeah. you, were, you weren't knocking on doors that weren't this, on the list. This data here largely represents uh, people who are already registered right. to vote. Okay. Um, but that's important for us. Yeah. Um, it's, but you know, we want to make the distinction that actually there are lots of people registered to vote who haven't voted in a very, very long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So most, the vast majority of these people are registered, <coughs> but in terms of people who are on this uh, number of statistics here who have actually voted in, say, the last 10 
years, the last two elections, is much, much lower. Um, so that, that's, that's an interesting contradiction which we want to kind of tease out um, throughout the whole debate. Um, One of the things which I think is worth useful saying, people have got slightly confused by this missing million question. Mm. That's not a million people who are not registered. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a million people who have either not registered or have never voted. Yeah. Mm. The missing million isn't people yeah. who are not. Now, yeah. one of the things that um, I've come across people say, oh yes, we've got this massive problem in Scotland. Large chunks of the population aren't registered at all because they were avoiding the poll tax. Um, I'm pretty sceptical that there's an awful lot of people who are off the voting register specifically because over 20 years ago mm -hmm. they came off to avoid the poll tax. This is um, a more generalised um, socioeconomic um, profile mm -hmm. of people who are likely to register, people who are likely to do bureaucratic things that come through their letterboxes. One of the things I think is important to, to say is that a lot of the low voter registration is among young people who are doing this for the first time. And there's been a lot of particular drive to sign up young people who are voting for the first time, targeting colleges and schools and places where young people are. So um, it, is, it is possible to get a little bit too focused on only who hasn't registered, which is a, small, a much smaller number than the bigger question of who generally doesn't vote. And so if we turn out the non-voters, uh, and bear in mind that there are always going to be people who won't register, and there are always certain places where, for all sorts of extreme reasons of perhaps poverty or deprivation or crime or various other things, you're not going to get um, engaged mm -hmm. communities. You, you, you're not going to have 100% turnout vote. Um, but I, I do, I, I talk to a lot of people who say, there's a million people who are not registered mm -hmm. in Scotland. No, there's not. There's a million people who don't vote in Scotland either because they're registered and don't vote or because they're not registered. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things we're going to get across. A personal, personal example of that was a couple I spoke to in Johnston <coughs> a few weeks ago. And um, I think she was 32. Her husband was a couple of years older than her and neither of them had ever voted in their lives. Mm -hmm. But they were intending to vote in the referendum. And after we had spoken to them for a while and given them some information, I think they intended to vote. Yes. It is. Sorry. Um, you were saying earlier that people who are cynical, I like to call it questioning, yeah. um, <laughs> suggest that you get a higher number <coughs> of undecided because yeah. um, you're coming from a particular position. Mm -hmm. um, but do you also factor in, again, sort of the, the positioning when you're knocking on the door, you know, if I go around and say, hi, I'm from the Cats and Kilts party, will mm -hmm. you be voting for me? Then folk will say, of course, we love yeah. cats, just to get me off your doorstep. I mean... Look, this is always going to be a factor when it comes to canvassing results. It's always going to be a factor. But what we are suggesting, what I think we've got a very, very good case for, as I've tried to outline today, is that if that was the case, why are we finding such consistency in terms of the percentages that we're finding geographically right across Scotland? You would find many, many more anomalies, right? And the reason you would find that is because no two canvas either sessions or teams are the same all different people, they all have a different way of approaching people. So actually when you factor in the sheer scale of the returns that we are reporting, I think you overcome that. And I would be willing to I'd be willing to, to put some money on if you asked a, a polling company what they thought about these statistics, I don't think they'd be willing to deny the veracity of our findings. Purely because of the scale, purely because of the geographical diversity involved in these statistics. But I mean, just when you go to doors, I mean, it's important that we... It's, a lot of people talk about apathy. And they say, well, if you're undecided, you must be apathetic. And if you don't vote, you must be apathetic. But we want to be clear, so when we're going into these areas, we are not finding people who are politically disengaged. We are finding people who are disengaged from formal politics. They're disengaged from the mainstream parties. They're disengaged from Westminster. But actually, when you talk about political issues, people are very, very politicised. Um, and that, again, is, is something which we want to reinforce. Um, you are right about the number of undecideds. I wrote an article about this to try and give some explanation. <coughs> it is because of years and years and years of just sheer disengagement. I mean, we want to make the point, when you shut down a library, when you shut down a community centre, you are also shutting down the potential for there to be a democratic political culture existing in a community. Because where do you go for your information? Where do you go to meet people and discuss issues? When you atomise people as a result of the neoliberal process over th three decades, this is what happens. Um, but astonishingly, despite all of that, look at the results that we're finding.
And this is what's exciting about the referendum. Just one thing to say to clarify, because this is unusual. I'm a bit of an old political hack, and I didn't think this would work. I thought this was going to be chaos. There is no script. There is no script which is used on the doors. So there is no training which says, ask this question first, ask this question yeah. next. And um, when this began... When this began, I thought, this is a recipe for chaos. You know, the, the old control freak in me thought, we need to control this. But it turns out that, as far as we can gather, people quite appreciate it when you talk to them as a person. And it doesn't feel like they're reading off a script. And that if there isn't a catchphrase which you use three times in one minute of talking to them on a doorstep, um, people can sense when you're talking to them as opposed to when you're reciting to them. Mm. And I think that's one of the advantages that we've got, is that uh, another one is that people spend crazy long times on the doorstep. I mean, again, yeah. from my old political hack days, you were told, one minute, two minutes, do the business, take the, the result, get away from the door. 45 that, in one case. 45 seconds was a stat. 45 was minutes we were in there. Oh, <laughs> so this is, this is genuine. Like people, there you go. Um, in this campaign, we can quite easily go for a very long chat at a doorstep with somebody invites you in for a cup of tea and, and, and you stay there. It's not normal canvassing. is another mm -hmm. important thing here. So it's not, it's not knock a door. Where are you? Um, hand over a leaflet and back home again. We also yeah. keep engaging. There, there, yeah. there was a script when I was at in Govan in the sense of the Stephen Noon sliding scale. What we have is we'll, we'll use that sliding script, scale, but, but Victoria yeah. probably... Yeah. I think it depends on how comfortable you are. You know, mm. most people that come and join us on our mass canvases have never chapped a door. Mm. I chapped my first door in February. Mm. I didn't have a script, but I found my way. Mm. But sometimes it's good to have, you know, a little blurb if someone isn't too sure mm. what to say. But most people may have that as a security yeah. blanket, but then they will leave that because they'll find their way. The most exciting thing, I think, has been people want to talk to you, whether they're yes, no, or undecided. Mm. People want that engagement, and they will say, oh, you know, politics has nothing to do with me, but then they will say, I spoke to my wages in childcare, I'm worried about the cost of food, I'm worried about payday loan companies too. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, these people are leading the conversations too, and they're interacting with you on a level that they've not got from their own councillors and their own MSPs and their own MPs too. So it is fantastic the work that we're doing. So this isn't about this isn't about us anymore, it's about everyone together. Mm -hmm. And I think we've started something that is really unique, and I think no matter what the outcome is in September, this is gathering so much speed and people are actually saying now, right, we're not going to accept the way things are. We want to be part of it and we want to change it. Yeah. I mean, it's also, just worth saying very quickly, very, very quickly, just about the methods of the canvassing here. Mm -hmm. Canvassing is really boring, mm -hmm. right? Canvassing can be really hard work, but it's especially hard work and it's especially difficult to get involved with. If you're turning up, and there's four people there who have done canvassing for the last 10 or 20 years of your life. They, you've never done it before. So what we wanted to try and do was to make the canvas an event. Yeah. Make it a mass canvas. Get loads of people <laughs> along. Pair people up with people who are experienced and inexperienced. And get people involved. Now, again, that is a potential recipe for chaos. Because we don't know who's going to turn up mm. at these canvas sessions. We don't know what all their politics are or all the rest of it. But, in all honesty, we want a bit of chaos. To be quite honest with you. We're not afraid of a bit of chaos. We want to have a situation whereby we are a bit of a, you know, we are a living, breathing social movement, that's and that's so got gary. all of, and that's got all of the contradictions politically and organisationally that you would expect, but it still delivers, mm -hmm. and it delivers especially well in a period where formal politics is, let's just say, not the flavour of the month uh, for most people. Peter's asked about for questions about yeah. five minutes here. Just a couple going back to the methodology side of it. Just, did you ask people they're likely to vote? Yes. So. And how we, did you factor that into what you? So, for example, so what we do uh, when we go around uh, people's doors, we say, are you voting in the referendum? Have you got any concerns? And so on and so forth. I mean, we give that spiel. Right? And as a result of that, we're able to gather um, data as to how people are voting. So we're recording how people are voting when we're going around, as, you would, as any organisation would when it goes canvassing. I think the difference with us is we're not just doing that. We're not just going to the door saying, how are you voting? OK, goodbye. We're going there and we're actually opening a discussion. That's why people end up getting invited into people's homes. I mean, this is, by the way, getting invited into someone's home is not just something which happens, you know, as a rare thing which, you know, has only happened once. If you actually speak to people, this happens quite a lot. And it's because of that approach. But I guess, but like, did you mm. think, but if someone's saying yes, it doesn't mean necessarily they're actually going to go and vote. They could tell you at the doors that they're going to vote yes, but it doesn't mean they're actually going to literally go and vote. Now, this is, this on, is, this is, the then, this is so. where it's going to come down to a huge mobilisation of the vote. So everything that's been gathered, I mean, this isn't just for, I mean, this is for all the campaigns, everything that's been gathered, where your votes are,
people are going to have to go around houses again and say, have you voted? Are you voting tomorrow? Etc. Etc. When it gets closer to the to the time, so there will be a huge mobilisation to actually to actually get the vote out. Um, this is still at the phase of engagement, working out where people are, and answering yeah, people's queries. And how is that mobilisation? What are you going to do? Well, when it comes to this, I will say that it's not just going to be Rick. I mean, it's going to be the entire Yes movement. There will be. I mean, I think there will be upwards of fifty thousand people. Um, on the day of the referendum, going around every single community in Scotland, going around to people that are voting yes and saying, this is the big day, have you voted? Do you need a lift to get there? Is your mum OK to get there? Is she on crutches? We can give her a lift, we've got a car outside. It's all of that stuff. We're going to have coaches going around communities, mobilising the vote as big as possible. Um, so that's how we we'll do that. Telephone knock off as well the day before. Phone yeah. people. All of the groups are working uh -huh. together as a single unit in whichever area they would happen to be in or whichever area they're needed in. And it's going to be everybody... So far in the campaign, we have all worked together, but we've also kind of done our own things. So um, we were for the day events. Rick have had their mass canvases. Um, everyone's kind of been speaking to the, the people that wanted to, to listen to them throughout the campaign. But when it comes to the initial days um, before and the day of the actual vote, everyone is going to be working together as a single unit towards the same single purpose, which is to get the voters out there. And yeah. when you talk about all groups, are you talking about all grassroots groups, or are you talking about Everything. the official Yes campaign There's as well? Because it's a bit confused about the fact that <coughs> we're all going to be working, we're all yes going to be working under the Yes whilst. umbrella. Okay. Saying that as well, Rick has grown every day too, and the mm. last week alone I've had 20 people approach me and say, I'm taking two weeks off my work, I'm taking a week off my work, I'm taking three weeks, what can I do? Can I join Rick? Can I come out? Can I chaff a door? Can I come to a stall? 20 people in la since last week. I have somebody Same. living with me just now who is from England and was originally from Scotland. He's on holiday, so he's coming up and he's out canvassing every single day and doing stalls every single day. He's taking time off work to come up just before the vote, three or four days before the vote, to assist in the mobilisation. He'll be bringing his car and transporting people to the polling station all day and then getting people out to vote. But just to be specific on the organisation, yeah. um, there are national organisations, um, which, such as the NHS, yes, and the, the kind of groups that are represented here. Once you get to the ground level, um, in almost all cases, you have, have areas perhaps where they're strongest, um, there'll be places where independent people know quite well and so they use it and so what you'll find is that each group is a geographical area within that group there are a number of different people who are working they may work solely as one unit so i know <coughs> places where you have um you know for example i know a rural constituency where everybody just does um acts as one group and they, they coordinate they do everything together and i know urban areas where within one group um, business for scotland people are people who are from the business community they're independent will focus on um, middle class areas and working class areas, maybe a radical independence campaign or labour for independence. And, and what you get is, um, and this is one of the other great strengths, you have this very high level of diversity, but with a geographical um, coverage. So each area will know best how it is doing its own turnout. The main thing to say is there are almost no areas that I can think of in the whole country where you've got people tripping over each other. So you don't have, um, you know, uh, let's say tomorrow uh, at the weekend there's a Leith Says I festival. Yeah. Um, what you don't have is a, a Rick Edinburgh tripping up over Edinburgh North and Leith um, for yes. They all work through <coughs> one broad geographical spread. But this is the other thing, which again, it's a bit of an old hand that I find quite surprising, is the ease with which they've all folded into each other. And so I do know places which are strong SNP and they are... You know they're canvassing that seat like they would have done for for an for an SNP uh, general election, and they've just absorbed the Greens, Independents, and others straight into that. Um, on the other hand, I was in a Fife former mining town talking to a meeting, sixty people, all of them local activists. Only one was in the SNP, and they were organised in a completely different manner. But both are covering every house, and that's the thing. It doesn't matter how they cover every house; they are. And, and, and that's the, it's that flexibility and diversity, which again, one might not predict it would have worked at the start of the campaign, but it's working. It doesn't work in theory, but it works in practice, yeah. and it is working in practice. You'll, you'll, you'll understand it's hard covering yeah. it because, um, yeah, there are a lot of different, a lot of people wearing different hats.
I, think I, I, I was just calculating. I think I've maybe done about 150 meetings in the last year, yeah. um, and that's in all sorts of different areas. And I haven't got an overall picture of what Hill's going on. I think it is. <laughs> it is. It is worth saying though right, that while, while there is that geographical um, cooperation and so on, I mean we do think in Rick that we've brought something specific to the referendum. Yeah. Uh, if you look at Yes Scotland, actually, I mean, it does start off as just a very, very sort of, I think, very white, middle class um, line. Um, and actually, what we're trying to bring to the table is the idea that actually, for the first time in a long time, the people who have had no say, right, who have had no say, now have the biggest possible say that they've ever had when it comes to, a, uh, to an election, to a referendum. So we think that we've tried to, we've tried to bring a narrative to the table which says, not just how great independence could be. We're actually unashamed about how saying just how badly we've been let down by Westminster, just how badly the Westminster system, the financial uh, services industry in London, how badly that works for the people, not just of Scotland, but right across, uh, right across Britain. Uh, and, and I think that actually, actually is vitally important to the outcome of the referendum as a whole. And just to say, those that say that the Yes campaign could be a little bit more negative or emphasise a little bit more the negative issues, been paying attention. And the working class communities in Scotland, we have been doing that for two years. Oh, thanks for that. Oh, yeah. Can I ask a specific question? The Labour Party. Uh -huh. um, what do you think, we've seen the results from Labour stronghold, what yes. do you think the long term impact on the Labour Party will be, regardless of the result? Regardless of, no, I, I think that you would have to take the result into account. Um, mm. If it's if it's a no vote, um, I think that despite the fact that Labour in Scotland has been hemorrhaging members, they will take that as cat board to continue as before. Um, if it's a yes vote, I believe that there will be a radical shake-up of the Labour Party in Scotland in its current form. And one at the back, and we take that as the last question. Just two points, really. You mentioned it was... Uh, positive to engage with people on a human level in terms of people doing their canvassing. Uh, how, how does that fit in the time scale? Do you have enough time to engage enough people and convince them in the run-up during the next four weeks? And secondly, with regards to the don't knows, what do you think the impact will be with the future TV debates uh, between Sammy and Darwin on the don't knows in the run-up to the, uh, the referendum? Well, can I just say that um, you're absolutely right. Uh, it would be impossible for us to get around that number of, number of people in the next four weeks. So it's a good job we've been doing it for two years. You know, we have, we, we've covered it every night, every weekend, for months and months this has been going on. So this is not about trying to start it from a, from a, from a, a sudden scratch. The, 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 the thing which will be a bit manic is that turnout. This is the volume of that turnout campaign is going to be something that we do have to manage quite cleverly. And I think that local groups will be starting to think about how they're going to do that um, uh, uh, already just now. An impact on the television debate. Um, this is something which <coughs> there has been genuinely no proper polling work on or no qualitative or quantitative research work on. And so I do warn that people are guessing and estimating. Um, my gut reaction to what I've heard from in a lot of public meetings uh, in working class areas is that they seem to me least susceptible to some of the big, what I would call the big institutional messages. Um, they don't, they kind of get, they're kind of used to being told that if they get minimum wage, the banks are all going to collapse or they can't have them. Or they've been the butt of scare stories for 30 years now about why we can't afford an NHS, why we can't afford welfare, why we've got to have the bedroom tax. And what I think is, what I think is interesting about these groups is that they've become quite cynical of the kind of scorched earth rhetoric of the kind of right of centre UK politics. You can't have this because. And they seem to they, they pay a bit less attention to that, I think, generally. I think, what's, um, I think what's important, and again, this is something which is almost taboo to discuss uh, sometimes in this campaign, what I think is important is um, motivation, confidence and motivation. And one of the things which I think will be important, and I would strongly encourage the SNP team when they're briefing, is remember that um, the, the role of um, the SNP as well is to give people the confidence to feel that this is a strong country, that it's a very strong case, that it's not a, defense, a defensive case, and that these people who are strongly and heavily tending towards wanting to vote yes 
to let them know they can do it with confidence. So if you ask me, the, the most positive impact that debate would have would be not a belligerent or an arrogant or an aggressive sort of confrontational thing, but just the calm confidence to say um, Scotland does have what it needs to be strong. We are, a, you know, we are a nation that can do this. That kind of confidence is the thing which I think will help in a lot of these communities. But it, 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 I really, I mean, it's not just a thing that I'm saying. I really don't believe that, particularly there, it's fundamental. It seems to me that there's a different kind of voter group. Um, if I put it like uh, those who might read a mid-market newspaper with a fairly big C and small C conservative agenda, um, they tend to have a much stronger emotional um, tie to what I would call institutions. What institutions tell them matter a lot. If the, if the military say something's bad, they tend to listen. If the banks say something's bad, they tend to listen. Um, and that group, it's much more important for them, I think, to debate. But when you get to those working class communities, they don't really trust institutions very much anymore. And so what institutions are saying to them is much less significant. And so when Alistair Darling stands up and says, the Bank of England doesn't like um, what you're doing, they, a lot of these communities say that the Bank of England doesn't like anything that's good for me. So I, I, in those communities, I do not think that um, a slugging match between two you know, big institutional figures is, is going to be particularly decisive. Going back to your question about, you know, the timescales and engaging with people on the doorsteps, I think um, whether you spend a minute or a half an hour or an hour with something, it's all valuable and you shouldn't be thinking about the timescales because as a society, we've lost that humanistic a approach of where you listen to people and you care about what they say, you care about their experience in life too. Because <coughs> right now, and it could be because it's very male-centred politics, we're treating people like battery hens, you know, and we're sanctioning people in the welfare system. We're, we're people, the welfare system is now turned into a sales job for the people that work in the job centre, you know. We're told they have to sanction 20 odd people a day. They have to sanction people with disabilities. And I think... The interaction that you're doing is so valuable, you can't actually put a price on it. In monetary terms, you know, it's invaluable what we're actually doing. Um, so when it goes up, when you talk about the timescales, I think even after September the 18th, we are still going to be engaging with people the way we started out engaging with people, and people are actually going to be sitting at the same table as everyone else. It's not going to be just left to hold it. And to prevent um, these media conferences from becoming feature films every day, I think we'll say that'll be enough for just now. And anyone that wants to grab us afterwards. You have to say just a couple of things, just very briefly, just in conclusion. Um, just because the question was <clears throat> asked about the Labour Party, <coughs> and the question was asked, and I just want to reiterate about the statistics. People's reputations are on the line with these uh, statistics. See, when it comes to September the 18th, we'll find out whether these are right or not. We wouldn't be saying this, we would not be saying this if we thought there was any chance that these statistics were, are completely wrong, completely out of the water. So, you know, it's absolutely a, a clear and evident to us that this is going to be a, the situation when it comes to these communities. It's about how we mobilise them. But we do think the Labour Party is throwing up a big, big crisis for itself, even if it was to be a no vote. Even if it was to be a no vote. Who are all these voters who have voted yes going to look towards? That's a big question which we'll have to answer. Um, but these statistics have to be reported as widely as possible, because they really are um, genuine, <coughs> and I think they are going to be the difference um, when it comes to the ESPO. Okay, folks, thanks again. Same time tomorrow. Can I just ask one question on behalf of a viewer at home? This is actually for the audience. Can I ask how many journalists are with us today? How many? One, two. Are we talking real journalists? Or Can I count you as a journalist? Three. <laughs> yes. Okay. Two, two are getting paid. Two professional, one amateur. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, Thank you. Okay. Um, Robin and George Jonathan, you can come to you next.